I also flew in from Tokyo last night. Uh, and uh, the good thing is, in, you might know Tokyo has two airports, Narita and Haneda. And uh, there's new flights from Haneda, which is very convenient. But unfortunately, it doesn't allow any time for sleep. So <laughs> also, I'm a little bit uh, in a yep. different, different world now. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for uh, inviting me here. It's always very exciting for me to be in the, the mecca for tech technology. Um, yes, I, I, this talk is uh, not the normal kind of 50 minute or one hour talk about keynote talks. It's 25 minutes, so I, I won't be showing Cuban Pac-Man. <laughs> not the first time, sorry. So uh -huh. you, can, you can see it on the YouTube or internet. But I wanna, I'll get straight into it. What I really want to talk about is uh, augmented reality, uh, as far as I know, really got underway in the late 90s. Uh, there was a mixed reality lab in uh, Tokyo, uh, funded by the uh, Japanese government and, and housed by Canon. And I think that was one of the early starts. And we've come a long way, and there's fantastic works here that you'll see. Um, but one thing is, if you look at the early days of augmented reality, there was a lot, a lot more uh, works which looked at all the different senses for augmenting our reality, not just uh, uh, the graphics. Uh, but over the years, I think because that was probably the most challenging problem, it was much more focused on the graphics. But now that we have a lot of real products coming out uh, on the mobile phone, and uh, you know, there's the WikiTube and a lot of very nice applications. Nokia is coming out with stuff and Google. So now that there are these things that are coming up, I think again, as a uh, community, uh, both research as well as companies can start to look at all of the senses for really augmenting our reality. And I think one uh, key motivation is that now we understand the brain even more through the you know, magnetic imaging that we can do and realize that really there's no separation between the mind and body. Uh, we, we used to think that uh, you know our mind is here some, somehow in the brain. Uh, the body can almost be separated, but it's not. Uh, you think through your body, and there's no real difference between the nerve cells uh, on, on your on your body and the you know the cells cells in your brain. It, in some way, analogies like internet, it, our, 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 our mind is not in the brain. It's like the internet, our whole body. That means all of the senses are very critical. And we're finding out more and more that uh, uh, touch, taste, smell can directly affect your uh, feelings, emotions, decision making, and uh, it's, a, it's a very important communication. So I think uh, the next stage of uh, augmented reality and research in this area, uh, as well as uh, products, should be looking at the communication with all of our senses. And I think we are going to the next stage of the internet. So now we've basically solved, I think, most of the problems about information, that you can effectively have infinite information in your pocket now and find out almost every fact uh, or any time. So information, I think, is, is or, or almost solved problem, effectively. Next stage is, is experience communication. How can we not just know? Okay, it is a uh, you know, uh, sorry, Celsius, not not Fahrenheit. It's 20, 23 degrees in Santa Clara. Okay, I can I can find that out on the internet. But how can I really feel the feeling I have when I'm in Santa Clara? It's different somehow because it's all of our senses and the fact that we're all here in this uh, meeting room and you know afterwards at the lunch and coffee breaks. The fact that we all came to this place shows that still we don't believe we can communicate fully through the internet. So we need to go from information age to experience age. And so I think for augmented reality researchers, we should uh, not just think about computer graphics, not just think about augmenting uh, with uh, our eyes, uh, and go to the next stage, which is actually like the Samurai, you might know the story of the blind samurai, and he could still kill all the enemies, even though he lost his, his sight, and because he could use all of his senses. So this become like the samurai. I want to show you some, uh, a few works, 
uh, in this, uh, this, this time. And sound is something that we think, okay, that's sold. It's not really anything to research in or make products in. But actually, sound uh, can be a very important uh, part of augmented reality. Something, some can be very practical and you can probably think about. So, for example, for the visual impaired or blind people, to be able to walk around their surroundings, you don't need. You can just you can use sound effectively, uh, maybe in some combination of touch, to do that. Um, and uh, also, uh, you can think of uh, communication applications as well. I want to show you a project which was uh, done by a uh, Keio University uh, student. And he worked on a project which just used sound and embedding into everyday objects. So again, let's augment all of the world, including everyday objects, in this case the umbrella. So this umbrella embedded with sound augmented reality can turn an ordinary umbrella into something fun that you can uh, entertain yourself. Uh, for example, when you're walking home or waiting for the train. So you can see just with sound, just with sound, you can turn, you can augment your reality and make your everyday entertainment. And uh, you can imagine, actually, it's very cheap. This to, to make that, I think, uh, you know, three dollars, just some sensor and uh, uh, some sound output. Um, you, we're all, you're all here in California, so I'm sure if you talk to George Lucas, make a Star Wars version of that. Kids would love it. Uh, so this sound, the touch is something that, you know, haptics, haptics research has been going on for quite a few years. Uh, we, especially in military, there's uh, a lot of uh, haptic technologies which are already in use. But in their every, everyday life, uh, not so much. And I think, uh, if you look at the, the brain, actually the limbic system of the brain is the, is the largest part of the brain. So without, so it shows that touch is very important, and I think we can provide a lot of very interesting interaction and information through touch into the body. A few years ago, I wanted to look at how can we touch or, or hug through the internet. And uh, so I thought, the first, first step I thought, to make a system where you could hug your pet through the internet, because still you, you cannot talk to animals, although I like to do that sometimes. Uh, so, but you can, so effectively, hugging is the way that you communicate with your your pet. So I chose the pet, which is a chicken, and because in Southeast Asia, uh, chickens were traditional backyard pets, and also.
course, the chickens are domestic animals, so they like to be touched. So it's a very good um, animal to do this uh, work on. And I'll show you a quick video of this now. It's a little bit old, this, this video, uh, but you can get the idea uh, how we could make touch interface uh, in today, today's technology. This is a demonstration showing how the touch sensors and parameters work. Each sensor corresponds to a parameter and a light emitting value. To demonstrate the tracking of the chicken and movement of the door, again we use a puppy chicken to represent the real chicken. We can see that the door follows the chicken's movement quite closely. You can see how the chicken responds while the people at the office touch the door. <laughs> On the other hand, if the chicken goes into the cage with the red door, we will not do anything to it. Over a period of time, we found that the chicken will actually choose to go into the blue door most of the time. The test shows that the chicken responds positively to being remotely touched. So, uh, the... <laughs> Thank you, Chico. Uh, the, the test did show about uh, uh, which you can read in a paper which we published a few years ago. Uh, nearly 80% of the time, the, the, the chicken would, would, would uh, uh, go to the door where we have the, the, the touching. So uh, this shows you can use touch for positive uh, communication in animals and of course in humans. Because after this work, um, I wanted to do this for parents and children to hug each other through the internet. So for example, we're all here at a conference and uh, far, maybe far away from home, but maybe you could call, call your kid and read a bedtime story and you know, give a bedtime hug. It's very difficult to do hugging through internet currently. And so this work here was basically similar, I think, but a little, bit, a little bit more sophisticated with air actuation. So it was a soft touch where people could hug together. And you can see a little demonstration here. Mum can be at work and you know, hugging a dog and the, the child will feel the hugging on the body. And uh, so uh, now my, my PhD student was working with me on this graduate already. And uh, so thinking about how could this be used for real, real products? And I think one thing is uh, maybe wearing jackets, maybe not ready for current technology. But what about things like that we already wear on our, hand, on our body, like watches and uh, rings? So you can imagine like uh, you could have a ring where uh, if you're uh, wife is thinking about you, she can squeeze her ring and your ring squeezes on your finger, right? So this is kind of like a just simple touch of communication can have a lot of meaning between people. And I think uh, uh, now I'm thinking to, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professor, so I like to think about the uh, in, in, you know, future of these things. So I thought, well, the ultimate kind of touch interface will be if we, uh, you know, have robots as friends uh, or or uh, love with robots. So I wanted to explore this uh, touching uh, through robots. So um, we did a work which is uh, seeing can people, if people feel affection for robots, they like to touch it. And so currently we're doing some work about analyzing people's uh, communication, even with a, a basically, in an, well, it's animated, but it's not a live object. And do they like to touch it? Um, and uh, Something, and then, then I began to think, what, what kind of things uh, would, is really difficult to do by, say, Skype, right? Let's say, so kissing is one. So you, know, you may want to 
like, you know, kiss, kiss someone, or, and it doesn't have to be romantic, it could be you want to kiss your grandmother on the cheek or something like that. So it's very difficult to do by Skype. Um, and a lot of our focus, as I said now, is on visual things and things on screen. So um, a student, one of the students, one of my students in care also worked on a kissing screen. I'll just briefly show this. By sensing the distance between the user and the display, this photo of a person reacts when kissed. This system is currently under development by a research group at Cambridge University, and they are also considering how to utilize this system in a commercial context. <laughs> <laughs> Time is short, so you get the basic idea. That's it. So, but I, I, although I can understand that might be a little bit fun, but ultimately kissing glass is not very enjoyable, I think. So these are the kind of things that I think we can't do through glass. We're just focused on glass interfaces now. So uh, I've been working on a, a, a kiss communicator with one of my former PhD students. And the idea is that to measure the pressure on your lips, and you put the device on your mouth and then transmit the actual pressure on your on your partner's lips. So to, to really try to experience the kiss through the through the internet. Uh, show you a little video of this here. because it's been shown smell and taste has a direct effect on your emotions. That's one, one thing which is different from uh, more logical communication like uh, uh, text and language that we normally use through internet.
Okay, so back, back to the story. So if we can if we can transmit smell and taste, it really can lead to uh, a, a different kind of emotional communication. And you can think of uh, things which is so difficult to communicate by language. So for example, you might be in uh, 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 Paris having some very nice uh, rare cheese in France or wine. You can describe that, you can write about it. It's almost impossible to understand. And if we could really transmit this, then we can have a new form of uh, internet communication. Uh, so one, one issue, as I mentioned, is that it's very difficult to transmit <coughs> smell and taste uh, through internet because it's very difficult to digitize. So I'm currently working on with a student uh, on a digital taste interface. And the idea is to uh, put a, electrodes on your uh, tongue and directly uh, stimulate the taste sense of the tongue. And that, if we can do that, then you can then transmit taste through internet because it's just using electric current. I'll show you a video of this work here. Oh, we have sound on here. But the basic idea now, it's a very early work, showing a very, very rough prototype. Uh, but it uh, uses electrodes and it can stimulate the tongue by electric current and also by heat. So it finds the uh, sense of taste can be actuated by change of heat as well as current. So here's the demo version. And right now what we're doing is we're, uh, okay, my, my students are always a guinea pig, so we're testing, and, and myself, we're testing by putting this electrode on your tongue, what, what flavor do you, do, you, do you experience? And so there's a, 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 a box here where you can put the, what flavor do you experience as well as the, the intensity. Okay, I'll just give a bit of here. Uh, so here's the, uh, the box that we're getting people to respond. And what we're finding is that most people can experience just by electrical thermo actuation, uh, salty, sour, and bitter. Uh, and some can experience sweet. The sweet, for some reason, is the most difficult and also uh, uh, short-lasting uh, flavor that you can artificially, artificially actuate. We're working on this, thinking <coughs> of some kind of uh, pulse signal or something. So you might think this is like uh, really, really like uh, impractical and, and maybe bizarre, but I think uh, if you think about it, in, in a few years time this could, this could be something like a, like a lollipop. Children like to uh, eat lollipops. And you can imagine an electric version of this, you put it on your tongue and uh, someone can send you a message, right? So if, you're, if your uh, wife sends you a sweet message, you know, yeah, everything's great. We send you a bitter message and she's in a bad mood. You go, what you get home. So you see that this is a simple case you can have this uh, message uh, communication. <coughs> and uh, uh, of course, that's, that's taste. And taste is just very basic uh, 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 salty, sour, bitter, sweet. Um, but more complex flavors like a mission full of wine is still very difficult. And uh, I, hope, I hope that some people here could think of a, a great idea. What, what I'm thinking of now is uh, magnetic stimulation in the brain. Because uh, some, some work now already in the medical field where they use uh, uh, transcranial brain stimulation. And it's showing promising the results that we can actually directly affect some neuron areas of our brain with uh, uh, false magnetic field. So this could be a way to have the final frontier of stimulating the smell. Well, I think it's uh, I think I've got a little bit of time, my thirty. So, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Let's take uh, a couple of questions from the audience. Oh, it'll be. It's the sound system that's off in the room. So everybody project really well. It's all getting caught on the video, on the internet, so. <laughs> Questions? Anybody? 
No? No questions? Yeah, I have a question. Oh, good, good. Um, have you guys looked at how the different senses can uh, interact with each other and maybe affect perception? Like, yeah, just different combinations, how they might also alter the intensity of perception. Yes, that's a very good question. And uh, in fact, there's uh, uh, some, some, some small percentage of the population, uh, I'm not sure the exact figures, but two or three percent, and they actually have what's called syn synesthesia. And because effectively our brain is all connected together, and uh, there's no real isolation. It's not like a computer where, where we have you know isolation of the uh, smell circuitry with the you know touch circuitry. There is overlap in the brain. Um, some people have synesthesia, so they actually can really, for example, smell red or or feel a sound. Uh, people thought they were a little bit, you know, wacky or just crazy for you know many years. But recently, because of the uh, fMRI mach machinery, we can actually see this occurs. You show this person red, and the uh, haptic or touch uh, part of the brain is, is actually stimulated. Um, so for what about for the rest of the population? Yes, it, it, it does occur, and, and in, to, a, to, a, to a lesser degree, but it does occur. And some studies uh, were, have been done, for example, with, actually with food. And uh, for example, if they, they made an uh, ice cream which had equal flavor of egg and bacon. Uh, okay, strange ice cream, this is research. But then, they, one group they played the sound of the chickens clucking, another group they played the sound of, of the uh, you know frying pan, bacon frying. And the group they heard the chickens said this this uh, ice cream is egg flavored, and the other group said it's bacon flavored. So it shows that the sound uh, directly can affect your taste. Uh, so this is very important, you know. So uh, if you you know when you go to a nice nice restaurant, oh, so and uh, it's it is true, you, you pay for the ambiance, right? You know the the, the the surroundings and you know the sound. Uh, just the fact that you know this is the expensive and famous restaurant will make food taste better, right? If you should serve the same food in the canteen, even if it's exactly the same, you will not think it tastes good. That's a good question. Yes. When you're testing for senses like taste, are you depriving the other senses possibly to get a better result? You mean in the, the experiments that you showed? Yeah. So, well, uh, that's a good question. I didn't, didn't, we didn't actually isolate other senses. Yeah, that's good. I mean, like for example, yes, you can imagine you would.